Chapter Twelve of the Adventures of Bindle by Herbert Jenkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter Twelve, The Tragedy of Giuseppe Antonio Tolmenicino. One. Hallo, Scratcher! cried Bindle as the swing doors of the yellow ostrich were pushed open, giving entrance to a small lantern jawed man with fishy eyes and a chin obviously intended for a face three sizes larger. Fancy meeting you! What have you been doing? Bindle was engaged in fetching the Sunday dinner beer according to the time honoured custom. Scratcher looked moodily at the barman, ordered a glass of beer, and turned to Bindle i changed my job he remarked mysteriously what you're doing inquired bindle intimating to the barman by a nod that his pewter was to be refilled waiter responded scratcher waiter cried bindle regarding him with astonishment yes at napolini's in regent street and scratcher replaced his glass upon the counter and with a dexterous upward blow scattered to the winds the froth that bedewed his upper lip well i'm blowed said bindle finding solace in his refilled tanker but don't you have to be a foreigner to be a waiter don't you have to speak through your nose or something no and scratcher's voice was the contempt of superior knowledge them furriners all gone to the war or most of em he added and so we get a look in what do you do inquired bindle oh we just take orders and serves the grub and makes out the bills and gets tips i made four pounds last week all but twelve shillings he added well i'm blowed said bindle then proceeded scratcher warming to his subject they often leave something in the bottles last night old grandpa got so squiffy he cried about his mother he did and it didn't cost him anything inquired ginger who had been an interested listener not a copper said scratcher impressively not a brass farden i wish this ratty war was over growled ginger four pound a week and a free drink blast the war i say i don't old with killin then continued scratcher you can always get a bellyful there's old ard scratcher interrupted bindle what place is it you're talking about napolini's replied scratcher looking at bindle reproachfully go on old sport it's all right said bindle resignedly i thought you might have got mixed up with evan when you takes a stew continued scratcher you can always pick out a bit of meat with your fingers if it ain't too hot he added as if not wishing to exaggerate and when it's white bait you can pinch some when no one's looking as for potatoes you can have all you can eat in soup well it's there scratcher's tone implied that napolini's was literally running with soup and potatoes don't go on scratcher said bindle mournfully see what you're a-doin to poor old ginge then there's macaroni continued scratcher relentlessly them bein italians long strings of white stuff there ain't much taste but it fills up scratcher paused then added reflectively you got to be careful with macaroni or it'll get down your collar it's that slippery i suppose old knapp ain't wantin anyone to elp mop up all them things inquired bindle wistfully scratcher looked at bindle interrogatingly do you think you could find your old pal a job at knapp's inquired bindle you come down to-morrow morning about eleven said scratcher with the air of one conferring a great favour three of our chaps was sacked a saturday for fightin well i must be movin said bindle as he picked up the blue and white jug with the crimson butterfly you'll see me round at knapp's at eleven to-morrow scratcher as empty as a drum and with a slong bindle passed out of the yellow ostrich nice time you've kept me waiting snapped mrs bindle as bindle entered the kitchen sorry was bindle's reply as he hung up his hat behind the kitchen door another time i shan't wait remarked mrs bindle and she banged a vegetable dish on the table bindle became busily engaged upon roast shoulder of mutton greens and potatoes after some time he remarked i've been after a job you lost your job again then cried mrs bindle in accusing tones something told me you had well i ain't retorted bindle but i heard o' something better so on monday i'm orf after a job what'll be better'n Artie's evan 
Bindle declined further to satisfy Mrs. Bindle's curiosity. "'You wait and see, Mrs. B. You just wait and see.' Two. On the following morning, Bindle was duly enrolled as a waiter at Mappolini's. He soon discovered that, whatever the privileges and perquisites of the fully experienced waiter, the part of the novice was one of thorns rather than of roses. He was attached as assistant to a diminutive Italian with a fierce upward-brushed moustache. Bindle had not been three minutes under his direction before he precipitated a crisis that almost ended in open warfare. "'What's your name, old son?' he inquired. "'Mine's Bindle, Joseph Bindle.' "'Giuseppe Antonio Tolmanicino, replied the Italian with astonishing rapidity. "'Is it really?' remarked Bindle, examining his chief with interest, as he proceeded deftly to lay a table. "'Sounds like a machine-gun, don't it?' Then, after a pause, he remarked quite innocently, "'Look here, old sport, I'll call you Kaiser.' In a flash, Giuseppe Antonio Tolmenicino turned upon Bindle, his moustache bristling like the spines of a wild boar, and from his lips poured a passionate stream of southern invective. Unable to understand a word of the burning phrases of reproach that eddied and flowed about him, Bindle merely stared. There was a patter of feet from all parts of the long dining-room, and soon he was the centre of an angry crowd of excited gesticulating waiters, with Giuseppe Antonio Tomanicino screaming his fury in the centre. "'Hoi!' called Bindle to Scratcher, who appeared through the service door, just as matters seemed about to break into open violence. "'Ere, Scratcher, what's up? Call him Orf!' "'What did you call him, Joe?' inquired Scratcher, pushing his way through the crowd. I asked his name, and then he went off like the mad minute, so I said I'd call him Kaiser, because of his whiskers. At the repetition of the obnoxious word, Giuseppe Antonio Tolmenicino shook his fist in Bindle's face and screamed more hysterically than ever. He was white to the lips. At the corners of his mouth two little points of white foam had collected, and his eyes blinked with the rapidity of a cinematograph film. With the aid of three other waiters, Scratcher succeeded in restoring peace. Giuseppe Antonio Tomanicino's fortissimo reproaches were reduced to piano murmurs by the explanation that Bindle meant no harm, added to which Bindle apologized. "'Look here,' he said, genuinely regretful at the effect of his remark. "'How was I to know that you was that sensitive? You lookin' so fierce, too.' The arrival of one of the superintendents put an end to the dispute but it was obvious that Giuseppe Antonio Tomanicino nourished in his heart a deep resentment against Bindle for his unintentioned insult. "'Fancy him taking on like that,' muttered Bindle, as he strove to adjust a white tablecloth so that it hung in equal folds on all sides of the table. "'Funny things, foreigners, as uffy as birds they are.' Turning to Scratcher, who was passing at the moment, he inquired, "'What the hell am I going to call him?' "'Call who?' inquired Scratcher, his mouth full of something. Bindle looked about warily. "'Old Kaiser,' he whispered. "'He's that sensitive. Explodes if you looks at him, he does.' Scratcher worked hard to reduce the contents of his mouth to conversational proportions. "'I can't never remember his name,' continued Bindle. "'Went off like a rattle it did.' "'Don't know his name myself,' said Scratcher, after a gigantic swallow. "'He's new.' "'Wouldn't help you much, old son, if you did know it,' said Bindle, with conviction. "'Seemed to me like a patent gargle. Never heard anything like it.' "'Ere,' said Bindle to Giuseppe Antonio Tolmenicino, who was darting past on his way to another table. The Italian paused, hatred smouldering in his dark eyes. "'I can't remember that name of yours, old sport,' said Bindle. "'Sorry, but I ain't a gramophone. What have I got to call you?' "'Call me sir,' replied Giuseppe Antonio Tolmenicino with dignity. "'Call you what?' cried Bindle indignantly. "'Call you what?' "'Call me sir,' repeated the Italian. "'Me call a foreigner, sir,' cried Bindle. "'Now ain't you the funniest old uggins?' Giuseppe Antonio Tolmenicino cast upon Bindle a look of consuming hatred. "'Look here,' remarked Bindle cheerfully. If he goes about a-lookin' like that, you'll spoil the good impression them whiskers make. Murder flashed in the eyes of the Italian as he ground out a paralyzing oath in his own tongue. There's a-goin' to be trouble between me and old Okey Pokey. Pleasant sort of cove to have about the house. 
Customers began to drift in, and soon Bindle was kept busy fetching and carrying for Giuseppe Antonio Tolmenicino, who by every means in his power strove to give expression to the hatred of Bindle that was burning in his soul. At the end of the first day, it was in reality the early hours of the next morning, as Bindle with Scratcher walked from Napolini's to the tube, he remarked, "'Well, I ain't hungry, though I could drink a deal more. Still, I says nothing about that. But as for tips, well, old Oaky Pokey's pocketed every bloomin' penny. When I asked him to divvy up fair, he started that machine gun in his tummy, rolled his eyes, and seemed to be trying to tell me what a great likin' he'd taken to me.' one of these days something's going to happen to him added bindle prophetically he ain't no sport anyhow what's he done inquired scratcher i offered to fight him for the tips and all he did was to turn on his rattle and bindle winked at the girl conductor who clanged the train gates behind him for nearly a week bindle continued to work thirteen hours a day satisfying the hunger of others and quenching alien thirsts thanks to judicious hints from scratcher at the same time he found means of ministering to his own requirements he tasted new and strange foods but of all his discoveries in the realm of dietetics curried prawns held pride of place more than one customer looked anxiously into the dark brown liquid curious as to what had become of the blunt pointed crescents but disliking the fuss attending complaint he ascribed the reduction in their number to the activities of the food controller when as occasionally happened in the absence of his chef bindle came into direct contact with a customer and received an order he invariably found himself utterly at a loss by buzz de marseilles pommes sautés called out one customer bindle who was hurrying past came to a dead stop and regarded him with interest do you mind saying that again sir he remarked by buzz de marseilles pommes sautés repeated the customer well i'm blowed was bindle's comment the customer stared but before he had time to reply bindle was unceremoniously pushed aside by giuseppe antonio tolmenicino who pad in hand bent over the customer with servile intentness what did he mean was he telling me his name inquired bindle of a lath-like youth with frizzy hair and a face incapable of expressing anything beyond a meaningless grin it was scratcher however who told the puzzled bindle that the customer had been ordering lunch and not divulging his identity bully bays de marsales pomme sorte is things we eat joe he explained you got to learn the main you well i'm blowed was bindle's sole comment fancy people eatin things with names like that he followed giuseppe antonio tolmenicino towards the service regions in response to an imperious motion of his dark well-greased head when bindle returned to the dining-room after listening to the unintelligible rebukes of his immediate superior he found himself beckoned to the side of the customer whose wants he had found himself unable to comprehend new to this job he inquired you've got it sir was bindle's reply new as new i'm in the furniture movin line myself but scratcher told me this ere was a soft job and so i took it on he didn't happen to mention okey pokey however hokey pokey interrogated the guest that chap with his whiskers growing up his nose explained bindle can't say anything without hurting his feelings never come across such a cove later when the customer left it was to bindle and not to giuseppe antonio tolmenicino that he gave his tip this precipitated a crisis once out of the dining-room the italian demanded of bindle the money you shall have aff old son said bindle magnanimously if you forks out aff of what you've had given to you see giuseppe antonio tolmenicino did not see his eyes snapped his moustache bristled his sallow features took on a shade of grey and discarding english he launched into a torrent of words in his own tongue bindle stood regarding his antagonist much as he would a juggler or quick change artist his good-humoured calm seemed to goad giuseppe antonio tolmenicino to madness with a sudden movement he seized a bottle from another waiter and brandishing it above his head rushed at bindle bindle stepped swiftly aside but in doing so managed to place his right foot across giuseppe antonio tolmenicino's path the italian lurched forward bringing down the bottle with paralyzing force upon the shoulder of another waiter who heavily laden was making towards the dining-room the assaulted waiter screamed giuseppe antonio tolmenicino rolled on the floor 
and the assaulted waiter's burden fell with a crash on top of him the man who had been struck hopped about the room holding his shoulder his shirt front dyed a deep red with the wine that had flowed over it never see such a mess in all my puff said bindle in describing the scene afterwards poor old okey pokey comes down on his back and a lot of tomato soup falls on his head then a dish of white bait gets on top of that so he has soup and fish anyhow funny thing to see them little fishes sticking out of the red soup he got an airing down his collar and a dish of macaroni in his ear and all his clothes was covered with different things an old bloomin menu he was holy angels but he was a sight for a moment giuseppe antonio tolmenicino lay inert then he slowly sat up and looked about him mechanically picking white bait out of his hair and removing a creme caramel from the inside of his waistcoat suddenly his eyes lighted on bindle in an instant he was on his feet and with head down and arms waving like flails he rushed at his enemy at that moment the door leading into the dining-room was opened and attracted by the hubbub mr james smith who before the war had been known as herr sigismann the chief superintendent entered he was a heavy man of ponderous proportions with dun dreary whiskers and a pompous manner his entrance brought him directly into the line of giuseppe antonio tolmenicino's attack before he could take in the situation the italian's head covered with tomato soup and bristling with white bait caught him full in the centre of his person and he went down with a sobbing grunt the italian on top of him the shock released a considerable portion of the food adhering to giuseppe antonio tolmenicino on to the chief superintendent white bait forsook the ebon locks of the waiter and dived into the magnificent dundreries of herr smith and on his shirt front was the impression of giuseppe antonio tolmenicino's features in tomato soup without a moment's hesitation giuseppe antonio tolmenicino was on his feet once more but bindle feeling that the time had arrived for action was equally quick taking him from behind by the collar he worked his right arm up as high as it would go behind his back the italian screamed with the pain but bindle held fast you ain't safe to be trusted about old sport he remarked and i got to old you until old whiskers decides what's going to be done you'll get six months for wasting food like this why you looks like a bloomin restaurant look at him bindle gazed down at the prostrate superintendent knocked his wind out you have struck him bang in the solar plexus blowed if you didn't with rolling eyes and foaming mouth giuseppe antonio tolmenicino screamed his maledictions a group of waiters was bending over herr smith one was administering brandy another was plucking white bait out of his whiskers a third was trying to wipe the tomato soup from his shirt front an operation which transformed a red archipelago into a flaming continent when eventually the superintendent sat up he looked like a whiskered robin redbreast he gazed from one to the other of the waiters engaged upon his renovation then his eye fell upon giuseppe antonio tolmenicino he uttered the one significant british word Belice. when giuseppe antonio tolmenicino left napolini's that night it was in the charge of two policemen with two more following to be prepared for eventualities giuseppe antonio tolmenicino was what is known professionally as violent not satisfied with the food that was plastered upon his person he endeavoured by means of his teeth to detach a portion of the right thigh of police constable higgins and with his feet to raise bruises where he could on the persons of his captors poor old okey pokey remarked bindle as he returned to the dining-room where he had been allotted two tables for which he was to be entirely responsible poor old okey pokey i'm afraid i got his goat but didn't he make a mess of old whiskers herr smith had gone home when a man is sixty years of age and furthermore when he has been a superintendent of a restaurant for upwards of twenty-five years he cannot with impunity be rammed in the solar plexus by a hard-headed and vigorous italian while giuseppe antonio tolmenicino in a cell at vine street police station was forecasting the downfall of the allies by the secession of italy from the entente bindle was striving to satisfy the demands of the two sets of customers that sat at his tables he made mistakes errors of commission and omission but his obviously genuine desire to satisfy everybody inclined people to be indulgent the man who was waiting for pancakes received with a smile half a dozen oysters 
whilst another customer was bewildered at finding himself expected to commence his meal with pancakes and jam when such errors were pointed out bindle would scratch his head in perplexity then as light dawned upon him he would break out into a grin make a dive for the pancakes and quickly exchange them for the oysters the names of the various dishes he found almost beyond him and to overcome the difficulty he asked the customers to point out on the menu what they required then again he found himself expected to carry a multiplicity of plates and dishes at first he endeavoured to emulate his confreres on one occasion he set out from the dining-room with three dishes containing respectively caille and casserole a welsh rarebit and a steak and fried potatoes the steak and fried potatoes were for a lady of ample proportions with an almost alarmingly low-cut blouse in placing the steak and metal dish of potatoes before her bindle's eye for a second left the other two plates which began to tilt the proprietor of the large bosomed lady was with the aid of a fish knife able to hold in place the welsh rarebit but he was too late in his endeavour to reach the underplate on which reposed the caille and casserole which suddenly made a dive for the apex of the v of the lady's blouse as she felt the hot moist bird touch her she gave a shriek and started back bindle also started and the lady's possessor lost his grip on the welsh rarebit which slid off the plate onto his lap greatly concerned bindle placed the empty welsh rarebit plate quickly on the table and seizing a fork stabbed the errant and romantic quail placing it upon its plate he then went to the assistance of the gentleman who had received the welsh rarebit face downwards on his lap with great care bindle returned it to the plate with the exception of such portions as clung affectionately to the customer's person to confound confusion the superintendent dashed up full of apologies for the customers and threatening looks for the cause of the mishap bindle turned to the lady who was hysterically dabbing her chest with a napkin i hope you ain't hurt mum he said with genuine solicitude i didn't see where he was going slippery little devil and bindle regarded the bird reproachfully then remembering that another was waiting for it he crossed over to the table at which sat the customer who had ordered calais and casserole and placed the plate before him the man looked up in surprise you'd better take that away he said that bird's a bit too enterprising for me a bit too what sir interrogated bindle lifting the plate to his nose i don't smell it sir he added seriously i ordered calais and casserole responded the man you bring me calais and cocotte do you mind saying that in english sir asked bindle wholly at sea at that moment he was pushed aside by the owner of the lady of generous proportions thrusting his face forward until it almost touched that of the calais guest he launched into a volley of reproaches mon dieu he shouted you have insulted that lady you are a scoundrel a wretch a traducer of fair women and he went on in french to describe the customer's ancestry and possible progeny throughout the dining-room the guests rose to see what was happening many came to the scene of the mishap by almost superhuman efforts and an apology from the customer who had ordered calais and casserole peace was restored and at a motion from the superintendent bindle carried the offending bird to the kitchen to exchange it for another a simple process that was achieved by having it reheated and returned on a clean plate this here all comes about through these coves wantin foreign food muttered bindle to himself if they'd all have a cut from the joint and two veggies it'd be just as simple as drinkin beer and ain't they touchy too he continued can't say a word to em but what they flies up and wants to scratch each other's eyes out tranquillity restored bindle continued his ministrations for half an hour everything went quietly until two customers ordered ginger beer one electing to drink it neat the other in conjunction with a double gin bindle managed to confuse the two glasses the customer who had been forced to break his pledge was greatly distressed and much official tact on the part of a superintendent was required to soothe his injured feelings seems to me muttered bindle that i gets all the crocks if there's anything funny about it comes and sits down at one of my tables right o sir comin he called to an impatient customer who accompanied by a girl clothed principally in white boots rouge and peroxide had seated himself at the table just vacated by a couple from the suburbs the man ordered a generous meal including a bottle of champagne bindle attentively wrote down a phonetic version of the customer's requirements 
the wine offered no difficulty it was numbered bindle had observed that wine was frequently carried to customers in a white metal receptacle sometimes containing hot water at others powdered ice no one had told him of the different treatment accorded to red and white wines desirous of giving as little trouble as possible to his fellows he determined on this occasion to act on his own initiative obtaining a wine cooler he had it filled with hot water and placing the bottle of champagne in it hurried back to the customer placing the wine cooler on a service table he left it for a few minutes whilst he laid covers for the new arrivals the lady thirstily demanded the wine bindle lifted it from its receptacle wound a napkin around it as he had seen others do and nippers in hand carried it to the table he cut the wires suddenly about half a dozen different things seemed to happen at the same moment the cork leapt joyously from the neck of the bottle and careering across the room caught the edge of the monocle of a diner and planted it in the soup of another at the next table just as he was bending down to take a spoonful the liquid sprayed his face he looked up surprised not having seen the cause he who had lost the monocle began searching about in a short-sighted manner for his lost property the cork continuing on its way took full in the right eye a customer of gigantic proportions he dropped his knife and fork and roared with pain bindle watched the course of the cork in amazement holding the bottle as a fireman does the nozzle of a hose from the neck squirted a stream of white foam catching the lady of the white boots rouge and peroxide full in the face she screamed you damn fool yelled the man to bindle in his amazement bindle turned suddenly to see from what quarter this rebuke had come and the wine caught the man just beneath the chin never had champagne behaved so in the whole history of napolini's a superintendent rushed up and with marvellous presence of mind seized a napkin and stopped the stream then he snatched the bottle from bindle's hands at the same time calling down curses upon his head for his stupidity the lady in white boots rouge and peroxide was gasping and dabbing her face with a napkin which was now a study in pink and white her escort was feeling the limpness of his collar and endeavouring to detach his shirt from his chest the gentleman who had lost his monocle was explaining to the owner of the soup what had happened and asking permission to fish for the missing crystal that was lying somewhere in the depths of the stranger's mulligatawny bindle was gazing from one to the other in astonishment fancy champagne behaving like that he muttered might have been a stone ginger in hot weather at that moment the superintendent discovered the wine cooler full of hot water one passionate question he levelled at bindle who nodded cheerfully in reply yes it was he who had put the champagne bottle in hot water this sealed bindle's fate as a waiter determined not to allow him out of his sight again the superintendent hailed him off to the manager's room there to be formally discharged ah this is the man said the manager to an inspector of police with whom he was engaged in conversation as bindle and the superintendent entered the inspector took a notebook from his pocket what is your name and address he asked of bindle bindle gave the necessary details adding i'm a special fulham district what's up you will be wanted at marlborough street police court to-morrow at ten with regard to he referred to his notebook a charge against giuseppe antonio tolmenicino said the inspector what's he going to be charged with assault and battery inquired bindle curiously under the defence of the realm act replied the inspector documents were found on him bindle whistled well i'm blowed a spy i never did trust them sort of whiskers he muttered as he left the manager's room five minutes later he left napolini's forever whistling at the stretch of his powers so the lodger pawned his second pair of boots end of chapter twelve read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com